adoptive slash foster parents who returned their children. What is your story? My mom was a foster parent when I was a child. We had a number of successful cases where they were eventually adopted. One set of kids I remember we had a going away party and cried when they left even though we were happy for them. We were well liked in the system because we would take in siblings or older kids. One girl we got when she was 17 and she had no desire to be adopted so we just let her run out of time with us. One set of brothers though made my parents throw in the towel. My parents are very stern people and my dad isn't scared of anybody. He's very tough. Farmer his whole life. But the older brother couldn't be controlled. The younger was terrified of him. There was also myself and my two siblings in the home. It started with him putting stuff in our food. He got banned from the school bus for having a knife and we didn't know where he got it. Then hitting my siblings and I. Even his own brother. Finding drugs and alcohol in his room when he was 12. My dad would call social services every day to get them to take him back. We were happy to have the younger brother, but my parents felt their own kids and the brother were in danger. One day the kid had a raging fit. We knew it was coming. He snapped and started chasing my little brother, who was 3, and had hearing loss, with a hockey stick. My mother grabbed all of us, and we locked ourselves in the bathroom. She called my dad, who showed up, and had to hold this kid down, and rip the stick out of his hand. Literally threw him, and his things out the door, and called the police. We all waited in the locked house, while this kid tried to beat down our doors and windows. Turns out he was placed with us, because nobody else would take him. My mom would only take non-violent near adults or kids under the age of 5 after that. Edit, since everyone is asking, the younger brother was taken with him. They didn't want to be separated. They were placed in a group home, and we haven't heard from them since. It's been a long time and I'm trying to track their last name down, so I can look them up on Facebook. Obligatory not my story but. My ex was slash is a behavioral analyst. Her job is to treat and educate children with severe behavioral slash emotional problems. One kid in particular, around 9 years old, was showing behaviors on the personality disorder spectrum, aka sociopathy slash psychopathy, prone to bouts of extreme violence, enjoyed killing small animals, utter lack of empathy, that sort of thing. Thing was, when he wasn't in a tantrum or killing things, he seemed very normal slash polite. A family decided to adopt him, knowing that he had issues, but know the details. The very first thing the family did was take him off all his medication. They were kind of hippies. Two weeks later they surrendered custody after an incident where he killed a squirrel at the park, hit people with the squirrel's body, swinging it like a club, then threatened to murder the mother when she tried to take it away. First time he'd shown a behavior that was overtly homicidal. When we were called about a 2 year old boy, we were told that he was difficult that there were some behavioral problems and that he was active. Lies, lies, lies. J was our first placement and we went into in with shiny eyes, certain we could take on this boy and make him all better. With 24 hours, I had reservations. A week later I was begging the agency for help. 4 months later and I was done. Mentally, this child was a 6 month old, and he was never going to improve. He was big for his age, he was fast, and he was angry. There was never a real diagnosis. The most severely autistic child anyone had ever seen. Sure. But also aggressive. Banging his head against everything until there was a bony ridge on his head. Grocery trips. A nightmare. Going into town was worse. He ran towards traffic, and as a 40 year old woman, long high speed chases were beyond my abilities. I asked for help, begged for respite, only to have the agency tell me that was my responsibility to find. When my daughter's beloved Irish setter had to be put down, I told them they would either keep him at the agency for an hour or they could pick up his crap at the end of the day. During that hour, while holding my daughter, they called four times. It took two social workers in a room to keep him confined, and they had no idea, really? My final straw was when he knocked a one year old baby to the ground and stood on her chest. We could no longer deal with him. At the next house he stayed a month. The next three houses? One day, then he was moved to a special home. We have five children in the house now, two biological, 
two foster, one adopted, the one year old he stood on, and after a long day of running and appointments, my husband and I look at each other and say still easier than Jay. Sigh. Awfulness. I'm a single mom. I have a grown biological daughter and 16 year old biological son. I adopted a very difficult to deal with son from foster care when he was 10 and he's now 12. I was asked to take a 15 year old because of the success I've had with my youngest. I worked very hard to have him be part of my family. We had visits and contact for almost a year before the moved him in. He was a tough nut to crack and the whole time we were visiting he said he wanted to be adopted. When he got to my house within 2 weeks he was saying he didn't want to be adopted and that he had no need for another mom, he had a mom. That's fine, I went in as a foster slash adopt to be someone's mom, but I could try to just work with being a caretaker and not a family member. He also very obviously had Asperger's. Well obvious after I weaned him down off some of the antipsychotics that they had him on that had him sleeping 12 plus hours a day when he first moved in. So with the Asperger's making a normal conversation nearly impossible I was finding myself a caretaker of a child who had no desire to join my family, he just wanted out of a group home, and he could make no real connection, because his mannerisms and the way he related was so off, that it just felt, like he was talking at you, and not hearing a word you said. Then enter the mom visits. Once a month he visited his mom for an evening, then about a week later he would explode on me in ever increasingly violent ways. After each incident I tried to show him that I was there for him and that we could work on it, but he made it clear he felt no remorse, and if my biological son wasn't there, being bigger than him, and he was the biggest person in the house with me, and my 12 year then there was a pretty decent chance that would happen again, I didn't feel safe. So even though I spent a year visiting with him and had him in my house for 6 months when he pulled a knife on me and my 12 year old and when I called 911 and found that it took the cops 45 minutes to get to my house I had to tell the county that I no longer felt like it was a good idea for him to be there. But despite that seemingly like an easy decision, it was an awful one. I had gone into this to help kids not bounce them back into the system. I'm the biological son of foster parents. They did care for at least 20 years, 10 before I was born, and 10 afterward. They also adopted my older sister at birth 2 years before that. On only 2 occasions have they asked the Ministry of Children and Families to remove a child from their home, and both times were very extreme cases. The first was before I came along. At the time they cared for a young man who to this day is spoken of as their most difficult child. It all reached ahead when he deliberately attempted to set their truck on fire while they were all inside. The second case came not long before they chose to leave foster care. It is not the entire reason they left, but I believe it to be a contributing factor. Anyway, a particular young teen they had in their care was arguably one of the better behaved ones. Hell, I even considered him a good friend and a role model. That is until he raped my older sister one night and was gone the next morning. I'm legitimately surprised by how fast this occurred and how well they were able to hide it from me. I literally went to bed one night and the next morning he was gone. I wouldn't even find out what happened for 2 or 3 years. My sister was a foster child. She went through several homes. Most of the time it was because of the shitty environments she was placed in like people who were clearly just using kids to get the checks and had upwards of 7 foster kids living in a double wide or something. But there were a couple times where she would be placed in a home and she wouldn't get along with the other kids and the parents would ask for her to be moved so as to avoid conflict and ensure a better living environment for everyone. And other times, in her own words. She was a nightmare for the parents and they would eventually give up and ask for her to be rehomed. Edit, if you're wondering, we ended up adopting her. Her and I were the same age and we had known her since she was a toddler when she'd immigrated from Haiti. Her dad married a woman who was abusive to her, so she was put in foster care when she was 14. My mother became her guardian of sorts, making sure she was taken care of and providing stability throughout her life. When it became clear how faked up the system is, my mom convinced my father to go along with the adoption. She's 25 now and doing amazing, can't imagine where she'd be if it weren't for my mom. Not the parents of, 
but sad story from my childhood. When I was around 12, a mom and her son Chester, Ike Foster not adopted, moved in down the street. At the time I was going to a charter school for troubled children, most had had and behavioral problems. So strangely enough he went to my school as well. Strangely because the school was across town and only had a hundred or so students. Our moms decided mine would take us, and his mom would pick us up. So I spent a lot of time around him and his mother. He had some social issues, had a hard time communicating clearly, and was extraordinarily nice always. His mom was extremely religious, and wouldn't let him watch most modern shows or anything she deemed offensive. So in the early 2000s his favorite and only show I ever saw him watch was that California Highway Patrol show with Eric Estrada. I say all this to make it clear he was a kind and benevolent kid who was over sheltered. The kind of kid who hitting puberty still believes babies come from storks. So the other kids in the neighborhood didn't like him. They in fact hated him. So this brother and his sister came up with this scheme and told their parents Chester had molested them. They referred to him as Chester the molester. I was a child at the time, so I don't know the full story, but the parents of those kids had the police involved, and Chester had to go away. I think my mother said he went back to the children's home. I don't know if this counts, because I was never technically either of those categories. However, I became legal guardian for my nephew when he was 20 months old and raised him until he was almost 7 years old. The entire time it was known that it would be temporary, originally it was supposed to be one year while my sister got her life together. Needless to say, my sister didn't bother getting her life together. Instead she got pregnant then got married then got pregnant again and now lives in a nightmare of a situation. I would have happily raised my nephew until he was grown, but his dad wanted custody of him and was working very hard for it. After a couple of years we began to grow our relationship with my nephew's father and worked really hard on co-parenting. His dad remarried and has a young daughter now and we felt that instead of trying to give my sister more and more time, we needed to end a guardianship for my nephew's sake. In reality, the longer we had him the harder it was to give him back. But as difficult as it was, I wanted to save him as much heartache as possible and have it over with while he was still young enough to heal. It doesn't help that we moved 400 miles away from my husband's job, but we are doing our best to visit him every 2 or 3 months or have him come visit us. We also talk to him every single week, well, as much as you can talk to a 7 year old. We didn't want to give him back, but we knew in the long run it was what was best for him and his family and his relationship with his sister. My grandmother is a foster mother. I have several stories, but by far the most faked up one is Lauren, name not changed cause fuck her. When Lauren came to live with us, she was a sweet Pentecostal girl who only wore skirts and never cussed. She was in foster care because her dad had sexually abused her. For several months she was perfect and quickly became one of my best friends. We were both 14, 16 when the story ends, then it all unraveled when she stole my mom's alcohol and blamed it on me. Well it came out that it wasn't me and that Lauren had been lying about a lot more stuff. She attacked my grandmother and she called the police. While waiting for the police Lauren went and beat her face black and blue and tore a good amount of hair out. She told the cops my grandmother did it. The other foster girl my grandmother had told the police that she had seen Lauren doing it to herself. So that was the end of Lauren living with us. After leaving, she told her caseworker that my grandmother abused her and that she was only fed three times a week or something like that. But for the first time, Lauren messed up. She said she wasn't given anything for Christmas and didn't have a birthday party. Her caseworker stopped by the day of her party to drop off gifts, but left before she saw Lauren. That was the beginning of everyone realizing how manipulating this girl was. About a year later the trial for the sexual abuse happened. I wasn't there, but grandmother had been asked to be a character witness against Lauren, or something like that. I don't really know, and I don't think she actually testified but this is what she told me. It came out that Lauren made every little bit of it up. Before foster care Lauren was raised in a privileged home where she got everything she wanted. She wasn't even religious. She made up the Pentecostal thing to make my grandmother and probably the other foster parents she was with trust her more. 
when she was 12 she was dating a 24 year old. I don't think he knew her real age until her parents caught them. She looked a lot older and her parents forbid her from seeing him and took her phone away. So she called his mom and told her that her dad abused her. I'm not going into the details, but it was very detailed and graphic. And she made it all up. She ruined her father's business, her mother's business, her brother got bullied. All because she couldn't date a guy 12 years older and couldn't have her phone. I was on the fence about it after the trial. I couldn't believe she made it up. Her story never changed, but then she ran away from her foster home. She posted a video on Facebook stating she was safe and she did in fact lie about everything. All she wanted was to go home to her parents because she was living in an abusive foster home. I call bullshit on them being abusive, although I guess it's possible. She lied and manipulated everything so I dk. I'm late to the show, but we are in the middle of this very thing right now. As foster parents, we adopted our son when he was 3. We saw some behavior issues, but figured that it was nothing outside the norm for a traumatized child. When he was 9, he began sexually acting out. We put him in counseling. The day after Thanksgiving he threatened to kill himself, so his counselor advised us to have him hospitalized. A year later, 2015, he burned our home down a few days before Christmas. He's been gone since, he stayed in one residential facility for almost a year and transferred to another one this past January. He told his counselor he has stood in our doorway at night with a knife, contemplating killing us in our sleep. We made the decision not to allow him back home. In order to terminate our parental rights, we have to be investigated for child abuse. Specifically abandonment. I'm a teacher, husband is a cop. It could mean we lose our jobs. Our other two, younger, boys are scared of him. We hired a lawyer literally today and paid a $5,000 retainer. That's in addition to the thousands and thousands we've already spent replacing things that were lost in the fire and paying for his care. The system sucks. After we spoke to folks with the state, we were told he has to come home and hurt one of us for us to be able to avoid being charged with abandonment. It's a mess. I don't know that we'll ever really recover from it. So I have a little bit of a different perspective on this whole situation. My mother runs her own adoption agency and has a program in multiple places including China. About 18 months ago she was working with this family to get their child home. They were going to adopt a little girl. I cannot remember the age of the girl, but she was definitely old enough to realize that the life she was living was not optimal, and even though most orphans are terrified when being adopted, she was old enough to figure out it was something that she wanted. So this family who has been causing problems during the entire adoption process get in a plane to go to China and I remember my mom coming home, and she was relived, because usually families like this one calm down after they get to see the child. So a few days later she comes home, and I can see on her face. It's the saddest I've ever seen my mom. This is a woman who has watched her stepdad basically turn into a vegetable, and been to some of the worst orphanages in the world. She is just devastated. She tells me that the family she worked day and night to help has decided they don't want the child. The family went to all the way to China and decided against it. The family left China and the little girl. I'm not a foster parent. It takes a really special person, and I know I don't have what it takes. But my mom has done foster care for almost 15 years, and I still lived with her for the first couple of those. She takes in older kids, so having a kid either voluntarily leave or need to be kicked out of the home is a little more common. Now, my mom is the most loving, endlessly generous and forgiving woman. Like I said, it takes a special person to do this job well. But even she has hit her limit with a few kids. I'll share the stories I have. The first kid she had to call the agency to remove was only 12 or 13. But man, this kid had a lot of anger. Someone must have broken this poor kid's heart. He could be so sweet sometimes. But when he was angry he had no control. He fought with my brother one day and chased him with a huge kitchen knife. Police were called. My mom didn't feel like her own kids were safe with this boy and she asked for him to be relocated. Only a couple of years later, we heard he'd gotten his girlfriend pregnant. Another girl, a teenager, seemed to get along with my mom super well. 
they were just best buds. My mom couldn't stop raving about how great this girl was. But it turned out that what she really was, was a master manipulator. When she got upset about something, she could turn ugly really fast, and my mom was the one to get the brunt of it. There were horrible fights, vulgar language, stuff I wished my mom wasn't having to hear. Then the running away started. Now, every time a foster child runs away, the parent has to immediately contact the police, the agency, and the social worker. Then there are police station visits and waiting up long into the night to be available for when the kid gets found. The day after they're brought home, the kids, well, girls, have to get a doctor to do a rape kit on them. Then there are mental health visits, sometimes temporary institutionalization. When a kid runs away on a weekly basis, it becomes an exhausting, stressful ordeal for the parent too. My mom was worn out by all of it. And she was frustrated by how the social workers would be all sweetness and understanding when they met with this girl. No matter how badly she behaved, they walked on eggshells with her, afraid to ever hold her responsible. Finally, my mom was fed up. I believe there was other stuff too, but it all led to the girl blowing up at my mom and demanding to leave, and my mom called the agency and told them she was giving her notice. The last one left a mark on all of us. This girl had gone through a lot of abuse, but had so many good qualities. Smart, great with kids, a progressive thinker. She came out as a lesbian to my mom and actually convinced my born again Christian mom that it wasn't right to discriminate against LGBT people. Her and I actually got to be really close. She would talk to me about her relationship struggles, the genuinely heinous abuse she'd been through. She'd been taken into care because her mom was on drugs, then been raped by her foster father. When she told her B.O. mom about this, her mom actually asked her what she'd done to deserve it. She was 8 years old. Later she went to live with her B.O. dad. He beat her when he discovered she was a lesbian and kicked her out of the house onto the street. Despite all this, it seemed like she was managing to become a well-adjusted person. But it turned out she had a lot of anger, common pattern with kids who've been treated like dirt. And her way of dealing with that anger was to beat her girlfriend. When she beat up her girlfriend badly enough that the police got called, my mom had no choice but to kick her out of the house. She wasn't going to have an abuser living in her house. The sick thing is that the girlfriend's family actually took them both in and let them live there while this girl continued to beat their daughter up. I can't speak from the experience of a parent, but having had an ex-boyfriend that was rehomed twice, I can offer a little bit of insight. As he told it to me, and one conversation with his most recent adopted mom, he was an international adoption from a South American country by American parents. He was an older adoption, and had a huge host of mental issues. From what I understand, his father killed his mother in front of him and his siblings. Then he was sent to an orphanage where more abuse happened, that his adopted family were in no way equipped to deal with. Note that the adoption agency that they worked with told them absolutely nothing about the trauma he'd been through or anything of the sort. As a result, mass chaos ensued almost immediately after they'd gotten him to the states. He had very deep-seated anger and control issues and his moods escalated very quickly between up and down, which lead to violent uncontrollable fits where he ended up not only hurting his adopted siblings, but also his adopted parents. One thing led to another, and they ended up rehoming him to a family that lived in New York that wanted to cure him with the power of prayer, and when that failed, he was rehomed to acquaintances of the family that gave him up. Apparently no one ever thought enough to get him to a shrink, and the rest is history. The bigger he got, and he is very big, he could easily be playing pro football. The more uncontrollable he became, and helping him took second fiddle to just letting him do as he pleased, and avoiding making him angry. We've been broken up for years, and I still deal with a lot of unwanted contact from him, but man, damned if he doesn't have one of the worst pasts that I've ever heard of in my life. Not the foster parent, but the foster child, I wasn't ready for a home. I was put into the state system when I was 12 because my mother couldn't take care of me. We were both abused by my father and she escaped when I was 2, leaving my brother and I to be raised by him and his equally psychotic new wife. I don't blame her for leaving us, she really didn't have a choice. 
My father had threatened to kill my brother and I if we didn't tell the judge in the divorce we wanted to go with him. I lived with him until I was 12 and then was sent to live with my mom. But our mutually unresolved issues resulted in her kicking me out with nowhere to go. So, I was placed in the foster home when I was 14 and it was too much for me. They wanted to be a family and I couldn't cope with that. I wasn't violent, just argumentative, passive aggressive, and just really really difficult. I really pushed them as far as they could go and really made the other two kids miserable. It finally came down to a difficult decision, one that in fact the foster parents couldn't make. It ended up being my case manager who removed me from the home. I had always been a weird kid, mostly antisocial but still seemed to do pretty well when I was in a structured environment. The freeform environment of a family finally enabled everyone, including me, to really see what my issues were and how I needed to be helped. I was placed in a therapeutic group home after that, and after years of intense therapy I learned to be better. My foster parents, brief as they were such, were great people and I really wish I had been better to them. But I just couldn't be a family with them, I wasn't ready. But they were ready to put up with me and try, even though I do think things would have gone very badly for them if I had stayed. My parents foster slash adopt. Four of my six forever siblings are adopted. The baby is the youngest's biological sister, but B.O. mom might actually be doing. She's only six weeks though, so time will tell. Meth is one hell of a drug. Anyway so my older three adopted siblings were my parents second placement. They were lied to a lot. My younger brother is now 9 and on the maturity level of a 2 to 3 year old. He may do well after all but during the adoption phase I was asked by my parents if I would care for him after they die. If I hadn't agreed then they would have had to come up with something I'm sure. He has fuzz. My sister, at 3, was described as feral. She was 5 when we got her. She is much better, almost a normal preteen. Now, these were the first of over 50. Then there was Lucy, name changed. Lucy was a preteen. Very sweet the first few visits. She was obviously being abused in her placement. We had the joy of doing lice treatments right away, for one. And it was not a new issue. Not at all. And so mom and dad suggested placement sooner. The foster mom, not wanting to lose her check, convinced the kid she didn't want to come to us. Mom and dad went down to see her after a few weeks and brought her home that same day. She had a few minor meltdowns pretty fast, no big deal. Then it got worse. My sister, 10 at the time, started acting like an abused girlfriend. She obeyed everything Lucy said out of fear of the consequences. We limited contact as much as possible and increased supervision. Lucy's boundaries outside got smaller. She got kicked off the bus for fighting. She went to inpatient care. Medicaid didn't want to pay, so they kicked her out. Mom was being beat up a lot. I recorded it even as proof and safety in case Lucy said we did something to her. Finally she went to a long term treatment center. Mom and dad quit fostering. They have a placement now, only because it's kinship and this is their last placement. After Lucy we are all just done. Not a foster parent, but I know a lady who's done it a lot in the past. She's had some real heartbreakers. One was the set of siblings, boy and girl, that nobody else would take. The girl, 14 or so, constantly ran away from everyone she was placed with. The boy, around 9 or 10, was well behaved, but he was in a wheelchair and had problems with messing his pants, which of course meant that his foster parents would have to get him out of the chair and clean him up because he couldn't do it himself. Social services was begging her to take these kids because nobody else would. She was an elderly lady and her house wasn't equipped for a wheelchair, but she finally agreed when told the kids didn't have other options. They were a temporary placement, I think they were very new to the system and taken because their mom was too ill to care for them and had an abusive drug using boyfriend. Social services was willing to give them back when she was well again and if she stayed away from the boyfriend. The kids turned out to be surprisingly well behaved. The little boy especially was the sweetest little thing. But he cried constantly, begging to go back to his sick mother. My friend always told him to wait just a few more days, a few more weeks, until mama was better, but he was inconsolable. He didn't care if he went back to an abusive man. 
He just wanted to be with mama. It was heartbreaking. Social services eventually tracked down some other relatives and gave the kids to them, and I think back to their mom again later. The saddest though was her long term placement. The little boy was only 5 or 6, and he had a lot of behavior problems. If he found food in the kitchen, he would eat it, all of it, like an entire loaf of bread in one sitting. He also took food and hid it under his bed, around the house, etc. to sneak later on. My friend was very confused and kept telling him to just ask her for food instead of taking it all and hiding it from her. Eventually, she found out that the boy's mother had trained him to steal food from stores. They were very poor and he often went hungry if he didn't obey her. The boy thought he would starve if he didn't steal food and hoard it as his mother had taught him to do. Eventually as he realized that his new foster mom always had food and wouldn't let him starve, he began to eat and treat food more normally. They became quite close. She called him my boy and he called her auntie. He was the sweetest little boy and I was always so happy to see him and play with him. He really blossomed and was doing well. She worked so hard with him and loved him so much and it really showed. One day when I hadn't visited them for a while, my friend messaged me to say hi. We chatted for a bit and I asked her how the little guy was doing. She said I had to give boy back a few weeks ago. He started killing and torturing my animals and I tried to stop him and teach him better but he wouldn't stop. He hung my cat. I just couldn't stand it anymore. I was in complete shock. I don't blame her for reaching her limit at that point, since he clearly had much worse problems that either of us imagined. But it was still heartbreaking to know that she had to give him up and that he was gone. Little guy, I'm so sorry for what you went through. I hope you're doing better and have found a good family. We still think of you a lot. We are foster parents. Our first sibling placements had to be moved when I became very sick and was hospitals a few weeks. There with some of our friends, we keep in touch. Second placement moved to kinship. Next placement was adoptive placement. We had them previously for respite overnight. Shortly after they moved in, we realized they weren't the basic level no issues little guys we heard. We found out they'd be given notice on several times. Pretty quickly we suspected the 1.5 year old had some major cognitive challenges. Evaluations confirmed that. Life was super hard. We have 3 kids already so adding 2 in that had many more challenges than we were prepared for was rough. We had decided when starting that major cognitive issues would be beyond what we could handle. We asked to hold off on adopting to focus on getting his level of care adjusted and getting help put in place. Due to his age. He didn't qualify for a lot of things. He had zero communication skills and cried all day. He scored around 6 to 9 months developmentally. We thought long and hard and met with our team to discuss possibilities. We all decided the best choice was for them to find a better suited family. So, we documented everything we could think of to help their transition and they moved. That time and the next few weeks were some of my worst. I felt so much shame and guilt. I felt terrible for letting them down and adding another move to their story. Now, I can be more logical and know that it was better of me to realize I couldn't give them what they needed. We took some time off after those guys and are now back at it. I was adopted when I was 14. For 9 years they were absolutely the perfect parents. When I was 22, living back with them after uni, because I was really ill, my ad mum completely stopped talking to me out of nowhere. She one day stayed in her room and never came out again, but messaged me on Facebook saying I was making her PTSD worse and I had to move out. Ad dad came up and was very nice to me, but was totally whipped by her and ended up driving me out to a friend's house where I lived the next few months. I never heard from my ad mum again. Soon after, she left her husband and all their pets to move in with a guy who had already made it clear he wasn't interested in her. She just moved herself into his house. About a year later, I found out she was living in a rundown flat share in a different country with yet another man and had bought a whole new host of pets. She was my savior for nearly 10 years. Then, nothing really changed how I see everything. I can't feel close to anyone now. I started being sick all the time to the extent that I got stomach ulcers. I don't believe in love. 
And dad kept on talking to me for a while, but I was angry at him for being complicit in what his wife did to me, and I began to get a creepy vibe. He would just be up on Facebook at 2am saying he loved me, and I was the most charming, erudite person he knew. How quickly my family vanished was a living nightmare. He told me Ed mum was crazy, and I had done nothing wrong, but he wouldn't tell me what she said slash thought I had done to deserve this. She accused him of being abusive which is BS. I have no idea if she was always like that, or if maybe something happened to her to induce a mental illness, or if she's just a cunt. My parents took in a boy when he was a young teen. He was good friends with my sister and they knew he was being abused at home. We had lots of run-ins with the family. Eventually his parents left town while he was at school one day just abandoning him. My parents decided that since he spent so much time at our house anyway they would accept responsibility and got legal custody. We were also excited for him to come home, make him part of the family. It was great. For a few months, then he decided he was in love with my sister and everything fell apart. She initially returned the attraction and then quickly changed her mind. He didn't take that rejection well. A lot of what happened could have ended earlier if we weren't too afraid of him to tell my parents. He was physically abusive to me and my brother, always in sneaky ways, so he wouldn't get caught. Burning me with a curling iron under my clothes. That time he hung me repeatedly then let me down before I passed out. There were a lot of threats and psychological warfare. You never knew what would set him off. He'd make me to roll joints for him and his friends then get me stoned or drunk so they could pick on me. I was 10. It was all bad enough, but whatever he did to my sister changed her. When my parents weren't home he would force her into the bathroom or into her room and lock the door. I know for sure he made her poop and do other humiliating things in front of him from what I could hear through the bathroom door. I don't know what happened in the bedroom. She's never spoken of it to me, maybe she's told her husband, but for many years, after she was broken, she regressed about 5 years. She just started over emotionally. It was heartbreaking. We all ended up in therapy for years. Even though my parents didn't know what exactly he was doing, because we were all too scared to rat they knew it was bad. I slept with a baseball bat under my bed and my shoes on, and spent all my time at a friend's. Eventually I just stopped coming home. My parents tried repeatedly to relinquish custody back to the state. Even when he was diagnosed with conduct disorder and sociopathic tendencies, I can't remember the actual diagnosis, but the one they give psychopaths when they are still kids, the state even threatened to press charges for abandonment if my parents kicked him out. By this point he had tried to hit my mom a few times and was deeply into drugs, self-harming, missing school half the time, cheating in the corner of his room and all of us kids were staying elsewhere. Finally he stole a car and took off. We didn't know where he went, but we hoped he's never came back. They found him a week later on the other side of the country and brought him back. A week after that he tried to kill himself and that was the out we needed. My mom and his therapist were able to get him committed and relinquish custody. Two years later he was out and kept coming around, stalking the family, seeking forgiveness. Luckily he disappeared again. I heard through the grapevine he was living under a bridge somewhere shooting up and panhandling a few months later. That's the last I heard. This was 25 years ago. He's most likely dead or in jail. We never speak his name to each other. My parents have never been told what kinds of things he did to us. My mom asked me once. I told her not to ask because I'd never tell. The guilt of bringing him into our home will stay with her to the end of her days I'd never do anything to add to that burden. My sister eventually grew up just 5 years behind emotionally. She never failed in school or anything but she was truly like a kid again and just started over. Her husband is a lot younger than her, but she seems happy. I think fostering kids is a great and noble thing to do, and I'm proud of those who make it work. My friend has adopted 5 kids out of the system, but I don't think older kids ever ever should be placed with younger and smaller children already in the home. Teens belong in teen only homes. Period. Saving a victim is great, but not when you replace them with 3 more. I have a pretty good life, but it took a lot of work to get where I am. I lost a lot of time wrestling with my demons. I've been on the other side of it. 
Me and my siblings were adopted out of foster care as a group and my adoptive mom was totally unequipped to deal with it. We had grown up homeless and unsupervised for weeks at a time and didn't have a lot of social skills. She took everything personally and got convinced we hated her and were always trying to manipulate or hurt her. She got convinced we had rad, not the real kind psychiatrists diagnose, but the made up kind you self diagnose with a chart from the internet. She resented me most because I was the oldest and used to mothering the others. Nancy Thomas, the mother of Beth, the girl from the child of rage doc, advocates a ton of weird abusive sheet. Beth is the only of her kids to speak positively of her therapy. She thinks abused kids have a natural relationship with Satan and are possessed. She advocates rebirthing therapy, rage therapy where they scream in your face and lick you. I'm skeptical of Beth's stories because my therapists always asked super leading, scary questions and you would be punished if you didn't give them the right answer. I confessed to crazy sheet because I wanted it to stop. I think my adopted mom was uncomfortable with some of it, but she was a weak person and easily led. Obviously none of this made us any better. I tried to run away. I ended up being sent to a teen camp where I learned to make beds and steal. My adopted parents had an unlicensed foster couple pick me up. I didn't see or hear from them again for years. Parents in the rad cult often shuffle kids around like between each other this illegally. Not a parent, but I'm in a family that used to consistently participate in foster care. We had a child that we had basically raised from birth. His name was Mikael, pronounced Mikael. We got him, and one month old, and he lived with us, until he was almost two. Everyone knew him as part of our family. He took his first steps with us, got enrolled in a preschool, and had many other milestones in a young child's life. I had always wanted to be an older brother, and I was finally able to- We loved this kid so much and really raised him as our own. We were in the process of adoption. We had filled out the forms, but we still needed permission from his birth mother because of how the organization we were going through worked. Despite that she had recently gotten pregnant with twins, had four other children she couldn't provide for, and had no consistent income, she decided to take him back. This devastated us. We had no choice but to give him back. We try to keep in touch with the mother and see how Mikhail is doing and how he is growing up, but she wants nothing to do with us. At best we get texted one picture a year. This has completely devastated my mom and we haven't taken in any kids since. I wouldn't give up the experience for the world. I love that little dude. My mom died when I was 8. Dad remarried 4 years later and we merged families. Me plus BRO plus SIS and her son plus ADOPTED son. Say what? For a year we didn't even know he was her ex's kid whom she had legally adopted before she had her own boy and then split. Adopted son, I'll call him Jeff, cause that was his name, clearly rated a distant second to her own flesh and blood and acted out accordingly. Her new kids were brighter and better behaved and Jeff made it his goal in life to take me, the eldest, down. Because being older and bigger than his spoiled brother was all he had over him and the last thing he wanted was an older sib. Stepmom defended him against me whenever he picked a fight, and in retrospect, I lack the maturity to appreciate the dynamics of the situation. My sibs and I had just spent 4 years with our crazy ass grandma and even at age 12, I wanted a mom again too. I wish I hadn't. A lot of things might have turned out differently. Jeff just kept up the black sheep behavior, failing grades in school, vandalism, fighting, usually with me, stealing, anything he could get into at his age. I grew to despise him. After yet another big blow up following a set of between us, I listed some of the things Jeff was into to dad and stepmom. Eyes got big, they wanted to talk to him. A few days later, we were told Jeff was going to the states to live with his dad, something he was clearly not looking forward to. So the only really adopted kid among the five of us got sent away. Cut to maybe 10 years later, I'm out on my own, and I get a call one evening. Hello. Hey, it's Jeff. Jeff who? Jeff, your brother. I was amazed, and more amazed he still used the word brother. Oh my god. Where are you? Rayford prison. You're in Rayford? Even in Van Calver, I'd heard of the Florida prison. How'd you get in there? And how'd you end up calling me? 
well. How he got into a tough state prison was a long story her didn't want to detail, but one of the guys had an electronic device that played beeps into the payphone and connected you with anywhere, free. They were taking turns for entertainment, and a helpful directory assistant had found my name for him, the only person in town with our uncommon last name. I updated him on what everyone was doing, but his turn was up, and we said goodbye. I wished him well, and hoped he'd go straight when he was out. He said, yeah, well, he'd try. Not a parent but a sibling. We had been an adoptive family slash foster family for years. I already had two adopted siblings and two biological siblings when we decided to adopt a 12 year old girl. I was also 12 at the time, so I thought it would be awesome. We forced ourselves to be best friends at first, but something just wasn't right. She had a horrible stealing problem. She would steal food and hide it in her room until it would rot. She would steal things for literally no reason other than to steal. We had to get a lock and key for the refrigerator and keep non-perishables in my mum's closet, also with a lock and key. She also had a compulsive lying problem and loved to ruin my relationships with my friends. I didn't realize until much later why they all stopped talking to me. That's not even anything though. Sometimes this girl, let's call her Jessica, would get super weird and protective of my younger siblings if I tried to come near them. I would knock on her door while she was hanging out with my little sister just to let her know it was time for dinner and she would scream at me for no reason. Things kept escalating until one day during my sophomore year when my little brother had a meltdown while we had company over about how he couldn't breathe when Jessica laid on top of him. Ah, turns out she had been molesting all three of my little siblings for quite a while and more than likely several of the foster kids we had had. And unfortunately it was very difficult to return her. Legally you can get rid of your own biological kids, but not ones you've adopted. They tried to remove all of us from our home at one point. When that didn't work she continued to stay with us, in the same house as her victims, for months. It wasn't until my mom tricked her into going to the hospital, she loved medical attention, that we were finally able to get her out of the house. I never saw her again but my parents were forced to keep visiting her for over a year. I spent my whole high school career taking care of my little siblings, so my parents could follow this court order that required them to spend more time with this monster than with their other kids. The whole family is still messed up, and it's been almost 10 years since I last saw her. Also, all of her charges got dropped when she turned 18, since she was a minor, so she can work in a daycare if she wants. TLDR, girl we adopted, was a pathological liar and kleptomaniac who molested every child under the age of 7 that we ever had in our house. I'm a preschool teacher and not a parent, but I have had a few foster children in my class. Think twice before you judge so harshly when a foster child doesn't work out for a family. I had a child this past year that mentally exhausted me to the point where I would ask to step out in the hall for a minute to take a deep breath. Sometimes these kids have been through things that have deeply damaged them and no amount of love and nurturing can fully reverse the effects. I can see where certain children could pose the risk of destroying marriages or families. Stress can do a lot of damage to people. This goes for the foster family as well as the child. Some children require a special skill set, and if a foster family discovers that they cannot meet those requirements, I do not judge them for admitting it. I have the utmost respect for foster families who are actually in it to help the children, and not just for the checks they receive. It's a heartbreaking and incredibly difficult job at times. I don't know if I could do it. My parents did we fostered one of my brother's mates for a short while which I don't remember much of, however after they sent him on they were offered two little girls without offering any details on their past, 3 to 4 and the other must have been 18 months tops, they opted out of the 18 month old as they were kind of past baby and kept the 3 to 4 month old. So that seemed to be okay for a little while however WR soon found out she had strong language difficulties, pidgin English she had developed with her siblings, and the habit of wiping sheet all around the toilet room. It was a few months in when she snuck into my brother room and he woke up to her riding him. He never told anyone till much later. 
my parents decided to give her up and the foster parenting gig. Once they noticed my brother's fearful behavior over the next few months and got fed up with not being able make any headway with improving her behavior. Turns out she had been sexually abused by her 13 year old brother, quite possibly her father, regularly left alone with a bottle and a TV, and generally ignored and received the usual substandard sheety parenting. Pretty much guaranteed I'd never consider becoming a foster carer. Not a foster parent, but I wanted to say thank you to everyone who is, or if their parents were foster parents kudos for letting these kids into your home. I thought about it for a while. My aunt and uncle were foster parents when I was young and would see the various kids at family events, BBQs and the like. They did it for a few years and got two children who were three and four I believe. Terribly abused, the father was in the military at some point and met his wife in Morocco and brought her to the US where he sexually abused those kids to the point the three year old boy needed recrustracite surgery on his throat and rectum. The mother was of the mindset that she had to listen to her husband. The wonderful state gave those kids back to the parents and a part of my aunt and, especially, uncle died. They stopped being foster parents and ran into the family a few years later at a store and there was another child and the wife was pregnant again. It took everything in my uncle to not kill that man. I don't think I could handle giving kids back after knowing their stories. M and A I'm so sorry all that happened to you. God they would be in their mid to late 30s now. I hope they ended up being relatively okay. Obligatory not an adoptive slash foster parent. I worked in a residential kids home for children slash teens with behavioral problems. One day we get word that we are receiving a new young person, approximate 14, to come and live with us as his, fairly elderly, foster parents can't cope with him anymore. We receive him and welcome him in a for a short while it's okay. However, this kid had a multitude of things wrong with him as his mother was an alcoholic and he was born with fetal alcohol syndrome. He was small for his age. He definitely had odd ADHD etc etc, but we suspected he had real mental problems, possibly even psychotic. He would talk to himself and or other people who weren't there. He would be fine one second then assault you slash self harm then very next. He apparently felt zero pain either, I'll get to that. He would absolutely trash his room and assault staff with bits of furniture etc. Place himself in danger by putting bags over his head, wasn't allowed metal cutlery or access to knives slash sharps. He would abscond and take off, placing himself at risk, and one time had to be rescued by a lifeboat after climbing onto rocks at the harbor. He became obsessed about one particular staff member and would take every frustration out on her. It was her fault that he was there, her fault he was the way he was etc. Eventually, after about two thirds months, it got so bad that he was sent to a secure lockup for kids. We heard he managed to dismantle his metal bed that was bolted to the wall by hand and then assaulted staff with the metal parts. He also punched a toughened glass panel on his door hard enough to crack it. I really don't understand how two people in their 60s cope for as long as they did. They had him since he was a baby and I think their routine was the only thing stopping him from completely falling apart all that time. We were all glad to see him go as it was hard hard work and not really what we were set up for, but it was a shame to cause in his calm moments he could be the sweetest kid you've ever met. Then for the rest of the shift an endless nightmare, it was physically and mentally exhausting. He'll probably live the rest of his life in an institution of some kind. My friends aren't adopted two brothers. The agency never revealed just how badly both had been sexually and physically abused, though the older got the worst of it since he was with his BO family longer. The younger also had some retardation and was born with addiction. It started off fine. I met the older one only twice and he knew how to play his sweet, doting role. But when he got angry, he was extremely violent, and at first they thought they could just be patient and love him to fix his anger. But then they caught him trying to molest his younger brother, so they could never leave them alone. It kept getting worse, fights at school and he threatened to rape the aunt, who had a physical disability, and would not be able to stop him in a year or two. He told her very calmly that when her husband left he would stab her, and rape her to death. They didn't feel safe, and after some more trying returned him, but kept his brother. 
they were charged with neglect for not wanting to keep him and had to go to court to get rid of him, which is when they found out a lot of the truth behind the boy's histories. He almost always in juvenile homes till he turned 18, then he went to jail for a while. When he got out it wasn't long before he beat up and tried to rape a woman, and so he went straight to prison. He calls them and tells them when he is out he is going to come get his little brother. They live in fear for the day. It is sad for everyone involved. What kind of life could he have had? What kind of person he could have become if his parents hadn't been such pieces of shit? He's gotten 10 plus years of therapy and they still called him and told him they loved him while he was in juvie, but at this point there seems to be little hope for him. Luckily his younger brother is doing well, though still years behind in mental development. We had an 18 month old that was a nightmare. I'm not sure what his life was like before he came into our care, but he was oddly manipulative for such a young child. He started off okay, and though he was a very picky eater for the first day or two, his behaviors weren't that bad. He had trouble getting to sleep, which we expected given that his life was just flopped upside down. Then, he went sidewise. He'd run up to you smiling with his arms up, and then scream bloody murder when we'd pick him up. When he did this, he'd push his arms back and arch his back and try to twist out of your arms. It was very effective at getting us to put him down, so we did, because not doing so would mean we'd drop him and he'd just throw himself around on the floor until we tried to comfort him again. This made him more angry, and he'd throw himself around harder, banging his head against anything hard he could find. He'd do this at meal times, without warning. He'd do this in public, without warning. He'd do this in the middle of the night, waking from a solid sleep, thrashing about in bed, and shaking the crib so hard that we had to move it 5 to 6 inches away from anything else he'd end up banging it against that object. He had to put padding in this crib to keep him from banging his head. We eventually had to put him in a padded pack and play since he started taking the padding off the crib and wrapping it around his neck and head and using it to bang himself harder. We couldn't get him to eat with a spoon or drink with a cup. He'd take the instruments and throw them as hard as he could. He would also take all the food in front of him and shove it into his mouth without swallowing. He'd then try to chew and it would just spill out of his mouth. He'd take the spill and shove it back in. I have no idea how he learned this, or why he continued it. We had to give his food one small bite at a time. He started holding that bite of food in his mouth until we gave him more. He'd wait for 10 minutes for more food and then do his head flop slash bang thing again if he got it or didn't get it. He understood words, sometimes. At first, we thought that he just didn't understand our accent. We live in the south and are not from the south. Some people around here have very heavy accents. Nope. Parents did not have accents. It was the most stressful thing we'd ever gone through. We've dealt with kids with behaviors, but nothing like this. We didn't know what would set him off, and we didn't know how to comfort him when did go off. We learned that food would help calm him down, sometimes. So we tried to keep good as he liked in plastic bags in our pockets. We had to have him rehomed when he did his flop slash headbang thing once while walking up the stairs. My wife was carrying our then 6 month old foster baby and holding his hand to help him up the stairs. This is one of the things he loved doing, so she wasn't at all prepared for him to do this. Suddenly, he wailed and flopped himself backwards. Because this was so sudden, my wife lost her grip on his hand and he flung backwards. My wife tried to grab him as he flopped, but the only thing she could get was the back of his neck and the back of his shirt. She was holding our other baby in her other arm. She held tight, but he wiggled and flopped, and spun and came loose. By this time, she had managed to get him down, so that there were only two more steps to fall, and he fell down them. He ended up face down at the bottom of the stairs. He looked up at her, totally calm and without crying and smashed his face into the tile floor and started bleeding. He didn't cry. He just looked at the blood and started playing with it. Everything about his injury looked like she beat the living crap out of him, but she didn't. My wife called the SS and let them know that she's bringing him into the office and she's leaving without him. We've been trying to get him counseling for months before this and they ignored us. I should reiterate. He was 18 months old. We told them 
that he was a danger to our other foster baby, and that his behaviors were going to get us investigated for neglect and child abuse. We wanted nothing to do with either, and we were not going to risk our license and everything else on trying to walk this poor kid through therapy. He needed serious one-on-one -on -one therapy. I want to say that he was autistic, but his behaviors were so odd that none of them really fit. He was super social until you tried to touch him. If you tried to touch him, all bets were off. He spent most of his time playing the pack and play with large stuffed toys. It was the only way to keep him safe. When I was a substitute teacher with a long term gig at the special needs preschool, my favorite student was a foster kid in a home with way too many kids. I want to say there were 9 kids altogether, but some were biological. Then the family up and moved across the country leaving all these kids homeless. We offered to take him temporarily and didn't even have to go through the training. I had 3 kids. My youngest was 5, this boy was 4. He had a lot of typical problems, hoarded food, wet the bed, didn't respond to discipline because you can't spank foster kids, his reasoning. Once they placed him with us, they never made any effort to find him another home. We had him for a year and a half. He had brothers and sisters, and after visits with them, he'd be off the wall. He was black and always lived in our mostly white community, which 20 years ago was more of a thing. I finally started asking if they were making any efforts to find family members or a more permanent placement, and they found an elderly uncle who took all the siblings. We never saw him again, because they took away planned visits with us for punishment. My kids missed him terribly. My aunt has been fostering for about 10 years now. The only kid they gave up came with two sisters. They also had an infant sibling, but my aunt refused, since she had a full-time job and she couldn't take care of a kid who was having drug withdrawals plus four other children. She ended up adopting the two girls, but only retaining legal guardianship over the boy. Kid was sweet sometimes, but he was extremely violent, a fake he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and a host of other issues. My older brother lived with them at the time, and shared his room with the kid. My brother would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night, because the kid was having a major meltdown. He was also extremely violent with himself, and with his sisters. He would hulk out and start throwing chairs or any loose items around him over the smallest thing. It broke her heart, but she eventually had to have him move to a group home where they could take care of him better. 